Welcome everyone. My name is Lynn Mooney. I'm co-owner of Women and Children First Bookstore in Chicago. And we're here in celebration of Douglas Kearney and his newest book, Show. Kearney will be joined this evening by Yona Harvey, author of You Don't Have to Go to Mars for Love. Hi. Um, we begin our virtual events the same way we used to start our in-person events. And that's just an acknowledgement, a land acknowledgement. Um, please welcome Please join me in acknowledging that the land on which our bookstore stands is the occupied, unceded territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux people. We encourage you to learn more about land acknowledgments and about the rightful owners of the land where you are viewing uh, this evening's event. Also, I just want to say, um, before we get into this evening's uh, business, we do have a terrific event coming up tomorrow night um, at 7 o'clock. Actually, we will be presenting um, an author discussion in honor of My Broken Language by Kudera Allegra Hudis. For this event, Kundera will be in conversation with Esmeralda Santiago. And it's an event that's co-sponsored by the National Museum of Puerto Rican Arts and Culture. So that's something to uh, watch out for. You can uh, sign up for it and watch it the same way you're watching our event this evening. And all of our events are recorded. So if you know of a friend or someone else that would really enjoy this event tonight or tomorrow night, you can still tell them about it. They can watch it on our YouTube channel. All right. So. Um, why we're here this evening, um, let me introduce our two poets. Poet, inter interdisciplinary writer, and performer Douglas Kearney has published seven full-length poetry collections, including Buck Studies, Mess and Mess and, and Patter. He has received a Whiting Writers Award, was named a notable New American Poet by the Poetry Society of America, and has been awarded fellowships from Cave Canem and the Rauschenberg Foundation. He lives with his family just west of Minneapolis and teaches creative writing at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Also here this evening is Yona Harvey. She is the author of the poetry collections, You Don't Have to Go to Mars for Love and Hemming the Water, and is a recipient of the Kate Tufts Discovery Award. She contributed to Marvel's World of Wakanda and co-authored with ta Coates, the graphic novel, Black Panther and the Crew. So I know you're all joining me, welcoming these two wonderful poets and I'm gonna turn this over to them and thank you. All right. I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, thank you. Women and Children First. Thank you, Lynn and Sarah. And um, thank you, audience members. No. You just, oh. Are gonna read from each other's work. We decided we're gonna read Did you do that? I don't one know. another's poems. So I'm gonna start by attempting <laughs> to read Every hard rapper's father ever, father of the year. And this is from Doug's book, Patter. It's a remix, Doug. So that's <laughs> every hard rapper's father ever, father of the year. Because we rhyme with bother, slant, brother, mother, smother, other, can be slurred to farther author made of hate far after fear because we rhyme with bother slant brother mother smother other can be slurred to farther author 
made of hate far after fear because we rhyme with bother, slant, brother, mother, smother, other can be slurred to father, author, made of hate far after fear because we rhyme with bother, slant, brother, smother, mother, other can be slurred to father, author, made of hate far after fear because we rhyme with father, slant, brother, mother, other can be slurred to father, author, made of hate, far after fear, because we rhyme with bother, slant, brother, mother, smother, other, slant, brother, smother, other, brother, slant, brother, mother, smother, other, and you can't, you won't, you don't stop, 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 and you can't, you won't, you don't stop. <laughs> Woo, Doug, you have math skills. <laughs> Kids, do not try this at home. <laughs> Doug makes it look easy. It's not easy. It ain't easy. <laughs> yeah, so wow. Uh okay. Um, and maybe we can talk. Actually, I'm sure we'll loop back around to this when we talk later, so I won't have any comments about that just yet. We'll come back. Whew, breath. <laughs> okay. Since it's in kind of an intimate group, I um I can I don't know. I'm gonna take some liberties, I guess, and read things that I don't normally read. Um yeah. So I don't typically read the dream district origins and that's in you don't have to go to mars for love why did you come here a god awful color does god have a face i came here to live how much do you care champagne spills nightly does champagne spill here I care enough. How could you doubt me? Your eyelids look swollen. Was I weeping? I doubted you daily. How do you feel the dance floor tilted? Do dance floors tilt? The answer frightens me. What have you eaten? Fall and winter moons, Mars, at opposition, the sky since dusk. Were you ashamed? Dr. King's speeches, First Lady Obama's, we people who are darker than blue. Why did you come here? Only God can hold a blasted angel or banish him or love him again or lift him up. I came here to enactness. The trace of something left undone, Nina Simone. You also heard her? I came here to finish. You recognized my hair, a chronic hangover. You drank the wine, soft kinks and sure shine. Why did you come here? Mount Everest, Kankajunga. You've climbed the overlook. I came here to die. Were you left alone? The postage stamps yellowed. You wanted to write letters. When no one was home, I stole inks and papers. Were you ashamed? Malcolm X. Tina Turner's interview. I don't ever remember being called a nigger. Why did you come here? Pollen from an Easter lily. How many filled the chapel? I came here to grieve. How have you changed? He cracked a speckled egg. Quail eggs keep here. I no longer worry. Could you love another? Lemon trees flourish. Will the trees bear lemons? Love made me weary. Your parents 
sacrificed? Someone left the gate open. Will you close the gate like their parents before them? What do you regret? Look south before dawn and tomorrow north. I'm not ready to be bereaved. Were you ashamed? Edna Lewis. How gently did you lift your eyebrows? And the few times I was, it didn't bother me. Why did you come here? Crystallized sugar on jar hung string. The string tied to a pencil. I came here to live. Why did you come here? Three dark scratches. Was the creature declawed? I came here to live. Why did you come here? Worry gives small things big shadows. The ferocity of your hands. I came here to live. Why did you come here? The chart wants to reveal itself as a living thing. You've met the seer. I came here to live. Why did you come here? This goes out to all the baby mamas. You miss her deeply. How can it be that she's gone and I live? My grief made me, my groove made me, made me, Anna Laura made me, made me eat and eat and eat tomatoes and cucumbers drizzled with vinegar, speckled with pepper, made me pork bacon in a skillet in a cast iron skillet, made me pig's feet, made me penny candy, made me shopkeepers wary, made me chapstick, made me halter tops too, telling, made me not telling, made me John 3, 16, made me Baptism made me bad perms, made me the car my mother couldn't afford, made me late payments, made me a key round my neck, made me you black, made me you look like your Aunt Teresa, made me cut grass and allergies, made me my father's strikes at the chemical plant, made me picket lines, made me no scabs, no scabs, made me a Duncan Hines cake, made me 10 weeping candles, made me a prayer and unplanned presents, made me fingers crossed and maybes, made me sugar, made me salt, not enough frosting, made me a paper plate licked clean. Okay, y'all, so few of us. I really wouldn't go there with a long poem typically, but I figure what the hell. And I'm here with Doug, so, okay. But I still got time on the clock. I'm staying on time. Um, all right, I'll do a shorter one, give you a break. This is the first poem in the book. It's called That. That. I grew up with pickles. I slept in the attic, cigarettes, sheets laced with smoke. The heat of my father's brother's old room. Larry Blackman painted for effect and Shaka Khan's lips more like a kiss, if a kiss could walk when it came to life. If a kiss could have hips and legs and ass, well, I wanted that. And if the colors could sweat and strip me down to my slip, well, I wanted that too. Nobody knew what I was thinking up there, though maybe they wanted that, that. And I am going to <laughs> close out with this poem. <laughs> Dream District, January. K 
can I read this poem in three minutes? Yes, I can. <laughs> January, I'm lost inside your industrial gray. My rig at the ready, my truck trucking, it's ginormous, tires flat ironing the road. Vivica Fox's mantra on the CB radio, black mambo, black mambo, more white static and fade. No word from the ladies out there. They know and don't know. They say and don't say. Don't say January. I'm driving past your peculiar highway sign painted Pasadena. January, you know, I'm nowhere near. Pennsylvania's no California and getting lost exhausts me. January, I pull the air horn on your fog. Pull over at a coffee house that looks like a house I know. But where are the woods, the village, and the goddamn snow? All my guilt and shame on the mount of books and poems I ought to know. Now, honey, read this. The Tina Turner lookalike owner says, hands me her copy of an anti-fracking manifesto derived from ancient tea brewing rituals. And by the way, that's all we serve. No coffee at this coffee house. Our specialty is green, Tina says, grown local by the community. All those T's and E's should put me at ease, but my bearings are lost. Where am I? Pasadena, Pennsylvania? Well, make it black and steep it long, I say. The day is wearing down on me. <laughs> okay. I think that's it. I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. If that's what you're going to do, okay. <laughs> but please, I know everybody's out there, but please, Jonah Harvey, y'all, give it up. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you so much uh, for having us, Women and Children First. Um, thank you, Yona, for uh, for being here. And uh, I, there's just a thing I have to say before I really begin is that uh, Yona Harvey, um, we went to undergrad together at Howard University. And Yona has like, was walking around like as a freshman at Howard University was just like, oh, that's that's a poet, right? And I, I didn't know what, what the hell I was doing back then. Uh, but uh, I met Yona I think it was second semester of freshman year. Um, we were both working for a comic book company. So, uh, and uh, that's where I became introduced to Yona as a writer and as a teacher and as a friend and as a mentor. I'm gonna read a poem from Yona's new book, which you really need to have. You need to have this. Um, this is, uh, you know, you don't have to go to Mars for love, but I'm gonna read this poem, Segregation Continuum after Ella Baker and Glenn Ligo. <clears throat> Layered in black on black on white canvas, we who believe in freedom cannot rest, looking at the way we look looking forward, stepping back by way of upturned neck, by way of three steps back, looking black coated, by way of black modes, by way of reconstruction, by way of insurrection, by way of colored fountains, by way of elected Democrats or elected aristocrats. It is obvious we are a presence, though we have been discomforted at school gates, at rental offices, at museum entrances. Even we cannot rest who believe in freedom. We are to some an irritant, an ire, some tire, some lot we do not describe just because something comes out of a leader's mouth, out of the mouth of a tyrant. So we are too difficult. We are much too difficult. We are much too aware. We are much too marked. We are all that matter to us that matter. We are the most comforting presence by way of nod, by way of pound, by way of sub. We are always fashionable when we do not try. We do not try to insult except when we do, but we do not hesitate to speak of the things about which we agree or disagree. We participate at the level of our thinking by way of our thinking, by way of our mass expression. We who believe in freedom cannot rest 
where once hundreds and even thousands of we ordinary people had taken a position that made us very uncomfortable when we decided, for instance, to walk rather than take the bus. And thank you. I mean, some of y'all got to know about this poem. Okay, so there's no terminal punctuation. And there's these refrains of by way of that sometimes fall at the end of the line and sometimes are in the middle. And so you have this constant enjambment that's building this momentum so that when we get to that final line to walk rather than take the bus, Yona Harvey has been making us embody that if we're reading it with her line breaks and breath in place. This poem is like marching forward, walking, walking, walking. So just like beautiful content craft, just like always something to learn from Yona. It's, it's wild. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to read a couple of things from show. A new book looks like this. <laughs> um, I think I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to start off with a poem uh, that is actually, um, I feel like this is kind of going to be like a, a secret Yona, uh, like love fest for me. So I'm going to read a couple of poems, one that's directly uh, for Yona and then just some other things. And they're all from show. All right. So this is a poem called First She Cuts the Stems for Yona Harvey. Systems are the end of a rope and the rope measure and border between out in. What desires entwine there? Uh, Say, black woman cuts peaches down. A paring knife will do the trick. Orchard to house, a booming taxonomic doing. Systems are frictions that flimflam as liquids. They abrade skin. In some systems, skins are tenor. Vehicles elsewhere. In, out, an abrasion lets. Low knocking at a door means a uh, master. Mister, some doorways kind of clear their throats from over. Bring them faster. Systems are what you're steady doing. Louvered shutters let the light. A metonym for how out outside or inside in. Well, Christ, gal, it's hot as hell. Some windows kind of roll their eyes. Cut azalea smell red as heat. Systems are will. Squealing wood, hinge, oil that. Gentle rattle. Slats a tremble means a breeze in. Say, a master's, mister's room. Black witch clipped finches, shrill in brass lattice. A bowl of peaches set down fast as hurry up. The door swung clear. Said something cold. A passage out to a corridor. Then a kitchen. There's a pitcher. What sweats out itself? What was in it? Some kitchens kind of slit the skins. What was in them come undone. Systems are when they say, when the say black woman cut a paring knife will do, then drop the stems entangled, jutting out the kitchen bin. Some houses kind of suck their teeth. The pitcher she pours in a cup, fluid, be so stupid finches, azaleas, rendered pets, decor for those for whom some systems are maintained. Lazy a paring knife will. And what are you doing? Calls of finches. The walls flinch. With that! Red as the bowl full of peaches. Pell-mell. While the breeze is cooling sweetness. All right. Um, so this next poem uh, is um, actually in 2015, Yona and I started doing this um, Kind of exercise exchange. Um, and so we were exchanging kind of poem prompts. Um, and uh, and so one of the prompts that, that Yona gave me led to this poem called Welter. Um, and the, the kind of contextualization is in the US, news broke regarding the discovery of a mass grave of Rohingya Muslims at a human trafficking camp the same day as the first Mayweather Pacquiao welterweight championship bout. And there's a lot of uh, language in here that sort of references television production and camera production, editing and things. Sick on it, cameras. Queasy green, lush, rush canopy. Tilt down, thick bamboo cover twine bound. Tilt down, welter. Dirt's got rags to gag up. Hijab stuck in done incisors. Zoom in and rack. What's that flesh there? Bone there bindled in cured skin. 
Presents, foul traffic, twittering pittas, bulbuls, upruffed humflies, flies plump as beans, boon the snowy brow, rufous chested sing song, jungle jangle, cut their throats, rufous. That was months. And was that months ago? The camp boomed, boom, get the boom shotgun mic out the shot, clean, cut. There's too many damn birds, dirty, cut. We can't use this, rap, swelter, late, wait, later, fight, woot, fights tonight, woot, of the century tonight, woot, wait, welters. So today is April uh, 14th, um, and a week from today, April 21, I mathed it, um, is the anniversary of the death of Prince. Um, and, you know, something that Yona and I have talked about a lot is uh, hair, like uh, hair in uh, Black culture and Black performance and Black entertainment. There's poems in uh, You Don't Have to Go to Mars for Love called uh, Performance Perms. Um, and I wanted to sort of reference that, but I'm also thinking about Prince and um, his hair particularly. And so I wrote a bunch of poems uh, that were about Prince, that are about Prince and his hair in music videos. Um, and so this is the one uh, for the video When Doves Cry. Um, and, and you might remember, if you, if you can remember that video, the way it ends is they have this sort of split screen mirror effect so that members of the revolution, including Prince, kind of disappear in it um, and, and kind of come out of that mirror. So there's a way they're coming out of themselves. So this is When Doves Cry, 1984. The bangs tangle, make a veil so to see you can't see the star. Clips of the star, the same tangles. Was a star when he played, he wasn't. But he wasn't a star till he played. He watched himself to see he got him right. A mirror makes him whole and splits him. Once he switched crown for a hat with a veil, he's unavailable. Veil mirrors bangs at the top of the clip. Veil bangs and bangs with a bullet. The hit all the way to the top with no bottom. No bottoms, no top, he sit in a tub. You don't, you can't see what's unrevealed. Tub like a limousine, the star in the limousine. His bangs like window tint, he look out. The steam like a veil he wear over his eyes like bangs. We can't see him seeing the self, seeing himself yet. Then he unveil himself as covered. Can you picture this? How could you just leave me standing alone? He asked the mirror. Why do we scream at each other, he say to himself. He can't see it. Split, he split, and spin into himself where he always was, beside himself with alone. And I'm going to end on a poem called Fire. Thank you all for being here. And after, you know, after I read this poem, Yona and I are going to have a, a brief kind of conversation. We're going to do our best to have a brief conversation, which I don't know has ever happened in the history of conversations. Uh, but following that, uh, we're also, you know, we'd also like to invite you to ask questions. I see one already in the chat. After that, we'll we'll get to those and, and, and bring those in. So thank you. So this poem is called Fire, and it's about the kind of erotic nature and sensual nature of the Holy Spirit in a lot of Black church contexts, um, you know, like, but what's always confused me, um, and I have to let you know, I grew up a Lutheran, like, like, like Norwegians and like Lutherans. So like when somebody would cough in church, people would be like, what happened? But when I started attending uh, black churches with my family as an adult, something that always stunned me was the eros in the music and the Holy Spirit and yet oftentimes from the pulpit, extraordinarily um, rigid senses about what is acceptable sensuality, what is acceptable eros. And so this poem is called Fire. God, we cry because nobody do us like the body. Oh, Jesus, love me, this side. No place low enough to keep me high enough for when I feel filled with it. I am not ashamed to kneel, not ashamed to sing, 
When I have that name in my mouth and oh, turn oh, and I turn ah, I am singing and turned what I owe to the blood, what flowed, what we owe, we owe alive, that body by that spirit. What's flowing by the spirit isn't ghost, lest we ghost it. I, I, from the row in the body of or up in it, my body up in my row, my eye roll up to lift, to wonder from where I get, what come, what's ghost isn't spirit. Spirit, what guides sopranos, keen pierce, it's licked, sweet glow high enough radiating, Sweat before me, what rides high the pierce they make to go inside us is, oh, in this place. Desk can't shake, pearl rung, what runnels me, what runs so alto, shoulder rock, nobody do us, oh Lord, oh the treble throat on its dark ladder, what rattle, come hither, come higher. Come lower, what wind rattle rock that don't rock, that don't roll. What's owed to the body of this is the blood. What's shed, come quiver, come quaver, climb lower. Oh, go down. Oh, do I chimes, entertainers, swears, sang now, get happy. They got it in them, get it in them, fill me, get me filled with what owed. I know it was, I know it was, I know it was the blood. Bear down over it, a cleft thou, thou enough for the tremulous tremor. The things of the spirit in this place, the basis, oh, we come down, we come go down, not ashamed, I, I, to come, go down, oh, deep black zenith, God, go down, lift up, take in what's licked, sweet body of the body of what's on high, oh, go down, oh, 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 I see, we sang a sweet body of the sweet body we give. I know it was what flow in the row, in the body of the things of the spirit. I turn a rock, rock, trim a turnt thing, nobody. I know it was, I know it was. My mouth full of sweat, what chime with what I know it was supposed to be, but shed like a skin, like a robe. Oh, I went down to the row in the sweet body of, I see, I hear what said, what said was too ashamed to owe. What flowed from the spirit? I know it wasn't. I know it wasn't. What I see, some said, like a snake, like a shame, what I owe, what I owe, went down in the row. The word don't do me. What I do, what I do now. That's, That's that one. So thank you all very much for being here. Uh, Yona and I are going to get into a conversation that we're happy for y'all to um, sit sit with us all. (laughs) Doug, you're my, yeah, hero, (laughs) teacher, longtime friend. Yeah, Mm. all the things, all the things. The shuttle will always burn. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but Doug, I have, I'm a kind of a hoarder. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that about me or not, but I just have this. I'm going to show the people. Okay. Like, Doug has been so instrumental in my writing. I mean, as a friend and as a just a reader, a listener, a thinker, Doug, your brain is just like, whoa. <laughs> but I have this old copy of when you sent me oh. comments, like I was trying to get my first book finished. So I have a whole Doug file, y'all. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he's like, I hope this helps. <laughs> anyway, just you're so meticulous in your thinking and your feedback and you know what I mean? And I just really appreciate you. I mean, this is old y'all. This is like years and years old. Wow. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Woo. you. I mean, I want to, I want to ask you something because I want to talk to you about the use of the concept of district in, oh. in the new book. Like, hmm. Like, um, I know they, they, they take on, they take on something, of course, more than what we think of when we think of sort of like municipal planning. And yet they do 
form a a a a kind of psychogeographic map of 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 an idea of a of a, of a part of a city, and I and I mean you do this kind of work, this kind of multi level work, the spiritual and the material, the psychological, the imaginative. So I guess I'm just curious about what building poems as you know units of a city um, mm. allows you to, to do sort of creatively and compositionally, just all that. I think well. I don't know if you remember this, but way back, actually you do remember this because archives, you sent me a copy of the poem City that I wrote when I was, mm -hmm. when we were at Howard. Mm -hmm. I can't, first of all, I can't even believe you had a copy of that, <laughs> which I now have. <laughs> so I think somewhere in there mentally, structurally, I'm always interested in that cityscape, city as a place, as personified even, you know what I mean? So I think, I guess maybe that persists. I don't know how intelligently I could talk about it, probably not at all, but you know, just, I think it's there. <laughs> also, because I didn't grow up in that space, I grew up in a really tiny city. Um, and so outside, since I always say I'm from Cincinnati, but really, I grew up in Mount Healthy, which is a tiny city, underground railroad city, just mm -hmm. outside of Cincinnati. So anyway, I think it's that. And then in, in terms of the way it manifests in this current book is, I think it's just like kind of got some little imaginative sci-fi leanings. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like I was reading a lot more fantasy. I was working on comic books and I think it just sort of, you know, materialized in that way, so. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Could I really talk about it that intelligently? I don't know, but you too, I'm gonna flip it on you because also yeah. in Black Automaton, you also mm -hmm. have, you know, city embodied. I mean, of course it's Los Angeles, um, but it's like a, it's a long, it's a longer series, you know? So do you wanna talk about that a little bit in terms of sure. your interpretation of how that works? Sure. Um the Black Automaton was a kind of a, a, a so I'll just I'll put it like this. So I'd written a series, I'd written a manuscript called Drowning the Cities. And the idea of that was one half of it was about cities um, and was using the cities as this kind of uh, like metonym or stand in for black experience. Because you know, in 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 my you know in my childhood growing up, like and you know you can see it in like media language, urban means black, right? And so cities are oftentimes associated um, with sort of black people. Interestingly, I mean, it's funny. Like like cities are oftentimes associated with black people, but black culture is very rarely like associated with cities because mm -hmm. you know like the, the music comes from other places a lot of times you know blues goes up through cities but but anyway so so that was something i was thinking about at the time so one half was about cities and the other half was about hurricane katrina um mm -hmm. and i showed this manuscript to nicole uh, my wife and she read it and you know she called me in the room she said it's kind of wanky <laughs> I love the call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, I left and took a long walk <laughs> and basically uh, chucked the bulk, the bulk of that manuscript um, uh, and came back uh, to write more poems and, and wrote really rather quickly. I mean, like a lot of that book is 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 gone. I mean, it's, you know, there's files of it, but I mean, a lot of that book didn't make it to be the Black Automaton. And so the Black Automaton was a, something that didn't feel so uh, distant or like it was trying so hard to have a kind of a performance of a particular mode of mo modernism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've jokingly called it like snorting T.S. Eliot's ashes, like, you know, like this sort of thing of like creating this kind of space um, where one is going to be thinking about allegory the entire time. So the cities remained, but in some ways, the the Showtime in the Burning City, which is a poem that sort of remembers um, the 1992, April 29th, 1992 
um, uprisings in LA um, uh, sort of destroys the city and the, and the, and the, the, the automaton on the cover of the book is smashing a city. Um, so, right. so the city became for me a kind of, a kind of way of thinking about um, as if I were not a part of a body of culture and tradition. And so I feel like the black automaton like knocks out that sense and, and allows me to, to be in the place um, that I was looking at somehow through some kind of gas lamped, uh, you know, Tiffany window or something. <laughs> um, I mean, I will, I will let us let everybody in on an Easter egg um, in the Black Automaton. Um, but if you look at each section, there's an illustration on each section. I'm being very presumptuous that you that you have a copy or that you could, you're interested in having one. But the sections are actually divided based upon um, the elements. So, so you can look and you can see that the condition of the city or some of the shapes in the city organized the, the sections of the Black Automaton by um, elements of earth, wind, fire, water, air. Um, yeah. Y'all yeah. need to get, this is, a, yeah. All of your books, this book especially, y'all need to get your hands on, yeah. Mm. Doug, can you talk about how, well, maybe, well, we'll see. Uh, like how, so you, there's Br'er Rabbit, there's John Henry. Um, I feel like there's just like a deep understanding of, I don't want to say it this way, but Blackness, Black cultural tradition um, that I feel maybe stems from your time at Howard, you know what I mean? Can you talk a little bit about how being a student at Howard shaped your early writing, thinking? Um, yeah, there's so many notes that I have. I'm trying to be focused. I'll, just, I'll start there, yeah. Absolutely, and I wanna, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick enough that I can throw a question your way too. Um, okay. <laughs> but, but, um, the first thing that I want to like kind of conjure about my experience at Howard was sitting on the yard, just like the large quad area and sitting in front of what was in, it might still be, but I can't remember if they've changed it, the fine arts building and hearing somebody singing opera coming through like an open window. And in that moment, just kind of going like, you know, maybe it's obvious, but I was like sitting going like, Black people sing opera, like, like black people sing opera. I'm sitting on the steps with a bunch of friends of mine who were like uh, my friend, Jason Yorick, who is a film director, filmmaker, and had been working on this film, which was like an underground martial arts ninja film called The Shadow Guild. And like, we're sitting there, Wu-Tang is playing in all of our heads at some level. And I'm just like, we're sitting up here, like thinking about Wu-Tang and ninjas, and filmmaking and comic books. There's somebody singing opera behind us. We're on this historic quad and nobody's looking around going like, what they think they're doing singing opera? Or like, you can't sit here thinking about the Wu-Tang or what you doing making a movie? Like none of that, like everything was possible in like a really dynamic way. So that drew me to um, like how we can explore um, you know, cultural traditions and ideas. I remember, I think it was in freshman year, I wrote a paper because I had a book of African-American folklore that I basically inherited from my brother during his years in college. He didn't go to an HBCU, but I had this book and I was had to do a research of a, a, a literature um, uh, paper. And I found a Stagali toast from uh, Philadelphia. And I was reading this Stagali toast and I was like, oh damn, this is gangster rap. So I did a report that was like Staggerly and Ice Cube. Um, and so I was like comparing and contrasting Staggerly and Ice Cube. And that was, you know, again, like in an environment like, like Howard, it was like there was an intergenerational recognition of something that was happening, but it was like suddenly that kind of thing was electric, relevant, and um, deeply rooted in something. 
And so that became a space where I really felt like my interest in mythology and folklore that I had before I came to Howard, really, I was able to dig into them in a way that I, that I felt was very meaningful at Howard um, and being around so many black readers, writers, creatives, it's just, yeah, yeah drew all of that out. Okay. Drew all of that yeah. out. I was gonna ask you a quick one, if I may. <laughs> so you write for comics, you've written for comics for some time. You also are a visual artist and an art historian. And I want to ask you a very nerdy comics question that uh, if uh -oh. that if <laughs> that if there's no resonance on it for you, please, you know, you, you ain't gotta make nothing up. I'm thinking about this. So if we think about pacing in a comic, mm -hmm. one of the major pacing devices is the gutter between panels, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you're writing for a comic, I imagine you're thinking about the pacing of time and space. You're thinking about an image and you're thinking about sound in very specific kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm curious, does that visual grammar, that sense of rhythm and organization, does that impact your poetry where a stanza might be like a gutter or a line break might be like a gutter. And now I'm being presumptuous, but I'm, but, but I'm curious, how does space, time and image, um, as you think about it in comics, impact your poetry and or vice versa? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's really more recent, so that I've, more recently that I've been thinking about that, um, it's when I first started writing the comics, I poetry was like my go-to rock anchor anyway. And so, and then also, you know, when I picked up Tanasi's story, the story that he started, there was already poems embedded in those comics. You know, it's, they were like Easter eggs, like you were saying, like, you know, if you knew, you knew, and it was fine. If you didn't, that was okay too. But Poetry was sort of like my crutch in terms of like, okay, well, how do I, I just got to in that first space, how do line breaks work, you know, and how could I compare a line break to turning the page of a comic and getting either that splash or that surprise mm -hmm. or whatever. And then, but I was just still figuring all that out. And now, especially this year, when I've had more time and space to think about that, I really see that it's more reciprocal mm -hmm. and i'm think like there's this po there's this graphic novel it's called this one summer mm -hmm. and it's uh it's a ya technically ya <clears throat> graphic novel it's really good but so in the beginning at on the very first page it's there's not not many words there's footprints i'm being too long winded in this answer mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> And so it's like, whatever, crunch, 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 the feet are moving, right? And then in the next page, it goes, at the top of the page, it's the word, so. Mm -hmm. And then there's all this blank space, and at the bottom, it's yeah. So it's basically a, a, a girl is taking a breath like, so, yeah. And she's about to tell you this really complicated story. And so that... Mm. One page, two pages, I have been like unraveling those two pages for many months because I'm trying to figure out how can I play around with that more in poems. I love just the breadth of that. Like, how could I get away with that same thing or translate that same thing in a, in a poem, you know, and hold people's attention, you know? So... I don't know if that I'm working it. I'm working it out to answer the question. No, that's, no, that's I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's it. I mean, <clears throat> if I think of, I don't know if you've read uh, Sean Webster's gentrification of the city of crime. No, but he has this one page where like, you know, you, you've got these kind of just a, a flow of poems and then there's just a page that just says yes. Or like, I think it says, Nope. <laughs> No, 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 it says no. Nah. That's right. It just says no nah. in huge letters on this one page. Just goes no. Nah. I love that. And I mean, I'm just like, I just every time I, I see that, I'm just like, damn, like how to make that kind of leap. And that, and I think about that in relationship to what you were saying 
Yeah. 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 Shout yeah. out to Sean to Sean Webster. <laughs> but you, I mean, you you have these leanings. Where well, gosh, it's eight fifty already. Uh, whatever, <laughs> it's ten minutes. To, it's not really. It's not eight fifty everywhere. In some places, we have ten minutes left, and there's a question. But I just want to say from Amanda really Johnson. We'll get to it. Yeah. Oh, okay. You yeah. just have all this graphic work, graphic design work, and really, I feel like comics. Doug also wrote comics, y'all, back in the day. I don't know why he's sitting here asking me questions about comics. Like, <laughs> you wrote Invictus. You were, you know, you were like the head writer for the comic. Right company after Kemp. Right Howard. after Kemp Powers. So, yeah, yeah. So right after Kemp Powers, who made a uh, Soul and uh, um, One Night in Miami. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Kemp Powers. Yeah. H U. H U. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> did you, how did you find your way? My, I feel like my questions are so broad, but I'm just, the design work, how did you become comfortable in that as a mode of poetry making, storytelling, like in your work, like at what point did that shift for you? Oh, that's a really good question. All right, so I took a graphic design class in like a weekend program class in like either high school or middle school. And the first thing I, I thought about graphic design, I was like, oh, it's drawing, right? It's drawing. But I learned at that point that graphic design is much more about like spatial relationships of information. Um, and so like, you don't need to write a, to draw a photorealistic image of something to communicate the information about it. So it's all about this kind of distillation, this sort of balance between abstraction and um, representation, right? And how it's like not just abstraction, but also abstracting, right? Mm -hmm. And that to me feels like <clears throat> there's an interesting relationship with, you know, how uh, language in poetry might deal with um, the image or deal with narrative. Like where is this sort of space of uh, compression, con concision, conciseness, and uh, abstracting in relationship to the concrete? <clears throat> and so, and so I started that there. Um, when I was working for the comic book company, Flatline Comics, I was arranging a lot of the uh, like media packages. And at that point, we weren't using computers to do it. So I was you know, cutting and pasting and creating compositions um, mm -hmm. using pages for the comics, illustrations, bits of press or whatever. And that really um, got me connected to this idea of information, text, writing as a kind of a plastic object. Like, Here's a body of text, here's a, a piece of text and I'm arranging it as a unit. After graduation, I moved to San Diego and that was 1996 and sort of right in that sort of uh, cicada wave, cicada cycle of page versus stage, page versus stage. Yeah. And so I began to think about well, what could we do if we made a poem that would perform itself mm -hmm. on the page, right? So mm -hmm. it's not page versus stage, the page becomes a stage. And so I started working at it at that point. Um, and, and, and so there were some poems toward the, uh, um, toward the, toward the uh, end of the 90s, but I'm gonna throw this at you. I sent you a poem about breakdancing oh. <laughs> uh, called B-Boy Battle Be Behind Sunrise Liquor Store. And it was all in this one like block, it's just a block. And you, your note you wrote back to me, which I still have in a file cabinet is, it says, essentially, this is a poem about breakdancing. Why is the poem sitting against the margin like a wallflower? Right. And so at that point, I began to try to make the poem work rhythmically in that idea of a page and stage setting. And the thing that I that that sticks with me about that, and then I'll, you know, then I'll then we should then we should answer Amanda's question. Yes. The thing that, that that sticks to me about that is the way the poem works when I revised it is it makes kind of a V, right? Like a, like a V across two spreads, across a spread. So the left side goes like this, the verso goes like that, and the recto goes like this. And the thing that's, and I always thought about that as being like when somebody's doing a backspin, they're wide at the top, but they're only connected to this one small point. But the thing that led to my further pursuit of the design is when I realized, oh no, visually that works, but the text should 
come from both sides or be mm -hmm. contrapuntal and come to that bottom. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think, the first moment when I realized if you're going to use page layout, you can create an embodiment. Not just a shape, but like an embodiment that communicates something about the poem. And so I think that's really where I started leaning into that. And uh, yeah. That's a great word, embodiment. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. I mean, you know, man has given us permission, but I, but I, but I do want to ask this question, right? Just put it out there. Just maybe it'll help focus our. our okay. okay. Can can both of you speak on the exploratory nature of your poems? Are you building the poem, shape and sound, as you write, or do you have an idea of what the outcome will be when you start? Oh, oh, this is fun. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm more I'm more interested in Doug's answer. <laughs> I can, I'm sort of guessing, I'm thinking about our many conversations, like what you might say about that too. But, um, <laughs> okay, but yeah, opposite energy. I feel, I do not know where the doggone thing is going. Like there's no shape, you know, I'm sort of, I've been practicing that more recently and practicing is in very loose air quotes there. But typically it is more like sound with me i know that that is my we it's my charm it's the thing that i'm attracted to and i also try to be conscious of like letting that go sometimes it's hard but amanda i love you amanda uh that's where it starts that's it always starts like in a sound and a feeling that's always the origin story of my poem mm -hmm. sound 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 and then everything else develops kind of out of that I'm trying to be less ADD in the future, but <laughs> that's how we roll. That's the true answer. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this um, to that question. I might have a a what 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 will we call it a a concept or like a, I don't know. A, I'm trying to think of a premise but I don't often know how I want to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Like the, the, the series Stagger Put Work In, which is where I like kind of, you know, again, go back to Stagger Lee, but this time instead of you know, putting him in conversation with Ice Cube, I put him in conversation with Heracles, who, you know, was also a bad man figure in, in his cultural context, also, you know, killed his family in the way that, you know, you know, Staggerly kills another black person um, in Killing Billy Lyons. <clears throat> so I knew I wanted to put these things together, but I really didn't know how it was going to work. I didn't have the language of it, and I didn't have necessarily a conclusion that I was going to reach. I didn't know what that was going to look like. And a lot of the times, especially when I'm working in like a series, a series of poems, um, I look for a framework that will hold a multi-sectional poem. So, you know, like if I want to write and think about something, I oftentimes like finding things that already present themselves in groups. Um, you know, Eche Caniculus is, you know, the Stations of the Cross and a Passion Place. That's 14 sections. Um, a list like uh, Fred Moten's uh, Natural History of Inequality, 16 items. So that's on there, right? So, so I know I'm going to have like 16 uh, chances to sort of investigate something or think through something, or in the case of stagger put work in 12 labors, I have 12 poems to work through. But I oftentimes don't know the language that I'm going to use, which answers so many of my questions right there. So I might start with the premise, but until I have the sound, you know, what you were talking about, until I know what a, what a, what a line or sentence is going to sound like in this world, I have no sense of how I'm going to approach it. And in my visual poems, Shoot, like I'll do a sketch sometimes, like a first draft, a rough draft sometimes, but so many of them are created through a process of accretion. It's only after I've made about 75% of what's available there mm. that I can even begin to like think that there's even a there there. There's a lot of stuff that just doesn't get anywhere in the work. So, mm. yeah. One of the things I really admire about you and your process is how you will out, not outline things, but you have said before, like, 
I, I've been thinking about the table of contents for this book and mm -hmm. these are my titles, you know, these are, and I just, I, I just think that's amazing, you know, and then you work your way in, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, it's, oh, an exercise that I have a lot is like, you know, dream table of contents, what would it look like? And then just right. sort of like backing your way into making that, that book. And, you know, with Patter, I had a table of contents and felt like I still had to write these poems to fill it out. And it was only after I spread all the poems out that I realized, oh, like 15 of those concepts that I thought were going to be poems really didn't need to happen because I had done it already. Um, and so yeah. that to me is, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a wild exercise. It's, it's a, doing that is what led to show. Um, because the book that I thought I was making with that table of contents, I looked at it one day and said, I don't, I don't want to do this book anymore. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, what do I have left? And I looked and I started finding all of these poems that I thought uh, wouldn't work. And suddenly they worked together. So, yeah. 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 I mean, oh. I mean, we, yeah, I mean, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, we're uh, like, we've been given, we've been given the power to shut off this, uh, <laughs> this conversation <laughs> when we sort of feel like it. But, you know, I don't want to like keep people here who might have thought no. it was only going to be an hour long. Um, right. But, right. uh, <laughs> but maybe, maybe do you have a, do you have a, another question you'd like to ask, or would you like to read one short poem from the collection? Maybe I know that you hadn't thought about this, but like, would you be willing to read? Uh, yeah, I'll just read a one? short, a shorty. Close yeah. out. We'll each read a shorty. Okay. Yeah. Shorty. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> I am caught off guard by that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Here's a shorty. For my daughter who's graduating from HU this semester. So there you go. Short poem for my daughter. Sonnet for a tall flower blooming at dinner time. Southern flower, I want to quote the bard, to serenade you, to raise a glass to you. Long and tall, you are always parched and hungry. You wobble in strong winds. You puff your bright hair when it rains. You toss off the lint of dandelions. You lean into the evening haunts with your indifferent afro. You were born in the old world city, the invisible dark girl city, the city that couldn't hold a candle, a straight pin, a slave owner sins to you. You are the most beautiful dark that hosts the most private sorrows and feeds the hungriest ghosts. Mm. Okay, thank you. Going to Harvey. All right, and I'll close out with one called Every Day I Gets. <clears throat> I play the stone, while old river tonguing me could fret me to grit. Nah, not fret, but loves me up what they do, what they do on the regular. I'm a lover when I'm fighting, peaceful here lately. When I cry, I say, he's having River's babies. And so, on the regular, I tend them. I tend to look mad as I find me, more sand now, but no. I'm fitful when I'm sleeping, wakeful a minute. My ears wet when I get up, like drowning, though I've never. All my dreams Chevrolet heavy. This land would swallow me for one damn pearl. Love that poem. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Please support the indie bookstores. <laughs> um, and wow, Tanya Foster's here. Sorry. Indeed, indeed. Right. I saw that. And that's like, I was like, read another poem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, women and children, first for hosting us. Um, everyone, you know, if you don't have this book, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, 
right? It's Stop like that. make make you what what's wrong? What's wrong with you? Why don't you have this book? It's out. You don't have it and it's out. What's wrong? Just oh, so get, Tanya, get Tanya, said <laughs> Tanya said read more. <laughs> no, Tanya. <laughs> 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 no, we gotta let these people go. <laughs> they running the oh, Tiny Foster is in the house. That's I'm right. Sorry. That's sorry. right. Bees. Um, but thank you all very much. And uh please, wherever you are, uh find safety. I don't like saying stay safe because a lot of people ain't never had safe. Um, so find it and if you can't find it just know to you know i don't know if i'm speaking for yona right now but you know protection 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 thanks doug all right love y'all love you thank you bye bye